Good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you, you get rested enough because we are going to be hit by the speech of the Professor Kambut because he is the, uh, the one who uh, created and uh, integrated the concept of emancipation into the IR discipline. And I am uh, so excited to be able to listen to him. So uh, I hope you will you all feel the same way, actually. Uh, my name is Rahmanda. Uh, even though I am disappointed that we cannot be together at uh, in Lisbon, actually, uh, I am glad to have the opportunity to connect virtually. Uh, so, uh, as the uh, Professor Murat Cemrek said in the opening uh, session, uh, I think we need to uh keep going to our meeting via this conference even even if it is online or virtually atmosphere all the partners have uh, worked really hard uh, to come up with this conference and uh, for the preparations i would like to thank to all the partners and the session international now uh, with any further delay let's get started uh, before <clears throat> Uh, giving the floor to Professor Kenwood, uh, Kenwood I uh, would like to remind you about something. I am sure that you are going to have lots of questions. Uh, and we need to get these questions in line uh, before the speech finishes, because uh, I am uh, really expecting to have lots of questions. Uh, so you can write your questions down in the chat section uh, on the right bottom side, or uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, either way, I will try to uh, keep to all the questions in line and uh, we are going to have uh, one hour and a half uh, for all sessions. So uh, I hope all the questions uh, will be asked and we will have enough time for that. So uh, Professor Wood, welcome again. And I don't think you need an introduction to all the participants because uh, you already well known. Uh, you are already a well known academician in IR discipline. So uh, I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation as a keynote speaker in the conference. Uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Professor. I think you need to unmute yourself, Professor Kambut, please. You already started speaking, but we can't hear you. I muted myself, that was okay. earlier. Okay? Um, yeah. yeah, okay. Bon dia, uh, good morning. Good morning. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, giving me the honor of inviting me. And I want to thank Professor Dag for his uh, generous introduction. I'm very disappointed to hear about um, Osgore's illness and please personally wish him a speedy recovery on my part. My only other disappointment is that we're being hosted only virtually in Lisbon because my wife and I have had many happy times over the years uh, in Lisbon. And so it's uh, appropriate for me to begin with a Lisbon story, but it's also um, um, a story which has an abris with perspective, which is where I'm speaking from this morning. In 1775, Lisbon was hit by, as many of you will know, was hit by an earthquake, one of the most devastating earthquakes in history. E.H. Carr, my department's most famous professor, recalled this calamity, this 1775 earthquake, when he was reflecting in 1939, uh, before the outbreak of the Second World War, on what he thought had been the muddled thinking and delusion about international relations over the previous two decades. Carr recalled that after the earthquake, there'd been a story about a hawker, a street hawker, a street seller, who had gone around the devastating city shouting that he had anti-earthquake pills to sell. 
when somebody in the street stopped him and pointed out that pills couldn't be of any use to stop an earthquake, he replied, but what would you put in their place? This, I think, is a story for our times as well. It's a story about great uncertainty and fear. It's a story about delusion and remedies that don't work. And it's about the challenge to come up with something better. And these are the three themes that I'm going to address uh, very quickly this morning. In 1945, the world entered a century long era, which I call humanity's greatest reckoning. It opened with the challenge of the nuclear weapons revolution, and it will close with whatever is done about the climate emergency by the middle of this century. I'm conscious that many other generations through time have regarded their own situation as being the most challenging. I think that is subjectively true. But my claim for this being the greatest reckoning historically is based on what I see as the objective characteristics of this era. These objective characteristics are the uniquely global reach of our lived experience. Globalization, the idea of a smaller world, for example, it's the result of us facing the highest stakes, the danger of nuclear winter, the climate emergency and the rest. And it's the coming together of so many global challenges at the same time. And what's to be reckoned with as we live through this era? What's to be reckoned with are the very ideas and institutions that once seemed to be the common sense, even natural answers to the biggest issues in politics and society, the biggest questions of politics, economics and society. These are the ideas that made us. These are the ideas that made the ideas and the institutions that made human society globally, what it became. So I'm referring to patriarchy, the domination of society by men, the intoxication with nationalism, my country right or wrong, the idea of sovereignty and its institutions, supreme, the search for supreme, uh, the demand for supreme lawmaking and law enforcing power within particular territories, the persistence of proselytizing religions, that is, faiths in competition for people's souls. I'm referring to the genius of capitalism when it comes to producing and selling, but the evil genius of capitalism when it comes to manufacturing inequality locally and globally, when it comes to maintaining class divisions and when it comes to abusing the natural environment. I'm thinking about the Clausewitzian philosophy of war, the idea of violence as a continuation of politics. I'm thinking about the idea of security on the part of great powers being countered in military hardware, as of course is still the case, as was very evident in the news across last weekend. I'm thinking about the idea and institutions that support race. Race. We can throw in other things. We can throw in rampant, rampant consumerism. We can throw in excessive idealism and the rest. A lot of powerful ideas and related institutions that don't work in the collective human interest or the global and do not work in the global in the interest of the global environment on which we all ultimately depend so these have been the the key ingredients of global business as usual over the years and their interaction 
through the centuries has been a recipe for division, destruction, disutility, disorganization, and danger. The combination of these ideas and their related institutions has led, to paraphrase Rousseau, to the insane sanity of international relations. This means the priority and the traditional common sense about nation states as the highest focus of decision making and as the highest focus of loyalty. It means prioritizing the national interest and self-help. It means the struggle for relative gains between uh, groups, classes, and states. And it means security against others, not security with others. Humans these days are a global we, a global we as a community of fate on a lonely planet. But we're not, or not yet, a global we as a community of shared values. And how could it be, how could we be a, a community of shared values while we hawk delusions about international relations that we can get somewhere with prioritizing the nation state, for example, being willing to die and kill for the nation state? How can it be um, other, otherwise? while we have these delusions and we ignore the logic of Albert Einstein's famous saying, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. In this critical era of human history, we are now in a pandemic. And for two years, it's dominated the international or global agenda. And I want to offer you uh, eight COVID cliches, that is overused, from my point of view, overused sayings, and, and I'm referring explicitly, I think, to or implicitly to the UK situation, but I think they're wider than the UK situation. And I'll offer a few rejoinders of my own. So the first cliche is, we are living in unprecedented times. We are not. The most unprecedented thing has been the overuse of the word unprecedented in the last couple of years. There have been scary pandemics before, and the Spanish flu was more deadly, relatively speaking, than what we have faced. And we're going to have to learn to live with the risk of disease after the pandemic has been suppressed. But this simply adds to the dangers of everyday life for many people in some parts of the world. The people who are all too familiar with living with the risks of disease. And it returns the most developed world to a situation that was familiar even during my boyhood. I remember in the 1950s how we in Britain feared smallpox and polio. So we're not an in unprecedented times. The second cliche is health is global, uh, which is trotted out by the British government all the time. No, health is not global. Whether it's vaccines or PPE, um, protective, device, uh, protective clothing equipment, the pandemic has been mostly conceived nationally. Vaccine nationalism arose primarily over the issue of sharing vaccines. No surprise here, since we're living in an era of enhanced nationalism. But if hoarding surplus vaccines and destroying them because they get out of date hasn't been bad enough, the true disgrace has been the failure to bring about global, truly global production of vaccines through technology transfer and the rest. Where is a global pandemic treaty. 
where is the G7 promise to vaccinate the world? The third cliche is, if all aren't protect, protected, none are. No, obviously it's better if all are protected, but we're learning how little we know about the, vac about, uh, the virus and or viruses. And we're learning that perhaps all cannot be fully and indefinitely protected. And what does protected actually mean? People will have to learn, as I said earlier, with enhanced risk of new variant, variant which may be able to escape the uh, vaccines that have so far been developed. And some will be protected, some people will be protected more than others. Fourth cliche, viruses know no borders. Yes, they do. Viruses get stopped at strong borders and find their way through to weaker borders, such notably uh, the borders of, between classes and between ethnicities. States have not fallen to COVID, but certain groups across the world have been disproportionately found out by the viruses. COVID, indeed, has assisted in the strengthening of state power. The Habesian bargain was a no-brainer for most societies at the beginning of this pandemic. People were willing to sacrifice liberty, in some cases, a great deal of liberty for the promise of more security. The fifth uh, cliche is, we must get back to normality. I say, no, we mustn't get back to normality because normality is the problem, not the solution. This was the way, normality was the way humans had come to interact with other species. Hence, zoonosis, the exchange of disease from other sorts of animals to ourselves. Normality was complacency regarding the warnings of dangers, health, hence, ill preparation on the part of even uh, very developed countries. And normality was delusion. It won't happen to us in some cases. The sixth cliche is New Zealand got it right. No, again, I share the view of those who think of the New Zealand response as a sort of ultra-nationalist model of isolation and eradication of the disease. This won't work, eradication and isolation. It can't, New Zealand's situation or Australia's can't be generalized. And if these solutions, so-called solutions were widely, widely tried, they would impoverish developing countries which are dependent on the global economy. So it's swapping New Zealand lives for the lives of the poorest people in uh, much of the world. The seventh cliche is the pandemic is a historical turning point. I don't think it is. I think it's had minimal impact on geopolitics globally. I think it will turn out to have been a relatively short term interruption in the global economy. And I think it will turn out to be a relatively brief disruption in society. The widespread and awful tragedy of COVID, the deaths and the illnesses, has essentially been family sized, not state sized. And the final cliche is. We're all in it together. No, we aren't. We're all in it very differently together, is what I want to say. We're only in it together in the sense that it's happening to human societies globally at the same time. But we are very differently together at the same time, according to our ethnicity, according to our color, 
according to the competence of our government or incompetence of our government, according to the stru infrastructure of our state, according to our gender, or our class, and all the other things that historically have stopped us being together. So what does the time of COVID tell us about the time of the globe's greatest reckoning? It tells me that there has been more continuity than change in world affairs. It tells me that there has been more business as usual than progressive change. There might have been some increase in globality, that is, there might have been some increase in global consciousness, but on the whole, I think we can regard the pandemic experience as Kenneth Waltz regarded international terrorism uh, immediately after 9-11. Waltz said, international terrorism is a mile wide but an inch deep, or if you prefer, 1.6 kilometers wide, 2.54 centimeters deep. What he was getting at was that international terrorism was a challenge attracting great attention globally, but not one shaking the fundamentals of international relations in any uh, profound way. And I would make the same point, I would argue the same point, I think, about the pandemic. So finally, what's my response to the Lisbon pill sellers question? What would I put in place of what's on offer? What would I put in place of the ideas and institutions that made global society what it is. I'll suggest just one set of ideas, and that's about thinking about global solidarity. I sometimes like to call this people's globalization. I'll leave it to you to decide whether people's globalization has as much or even more self-delusion than that of the hawker 250 years ago in Lisbon. I want to start with a favorite slogan of Philip Allert. Philip Allert is a philosophically minded international lawyer and former diplomat, and I think he's one of the most unrecognized uh, thinkers about international race relations. <clears throat> and Philip likes to say, what is needed is a revolution, but in the mind, not in the streets. For me, this revolution starts with the idea that human reality is made up of ideas. That is, it is mind made. Humans have agency. We have the capacity to act. And history is a story of never say never. When we think of the transformations, the fantastic transformations across the existence of our species, of Homo sapiens, when we think of these transformations, surely Lenin was right when he said, there is nothing as radical as reality. Never say never. And, and these are the starting point for me in the, the network or the, the foundations for having rational hope about our future. Not optimism, but not pessimism, but rational hope. History shows that what in one period seemed impossible, 
impractical, idealistic, unrealistic, even utopia. What was once thought impossible can become normal, commonsensical, even natural in another period. Think of an idea such as gender equality, for example, or think of an ideal such as donating money to help survivors of natural disasters half a world away. My granddad, the one I knew, was a very generous person. I think a more generous person on a personal level than I am. And he wouldn't have thought of the idea of using some of his hard worked word money, hard earned money, uh, to give to a, ch a, a charity wanting to help out people suffering from nat some natural disaster half away the world away. His line would have been the old one at that time of charity begins at home. Uh, I think it's quite appropriate. It's normal to, for us in the developed world to give money to help people in natural disasters. What's the difference? Not because I've become wiser. I'm not in my person, I think, more generous than my grandfather. What happened is that I was brought up with different ideas and institutions, which led us to think it was quite normal to help people halfway across the world. So what seems seemed impossible or unrealistic or utopian in one generation can appear normal in another generation. <clears throat> Life offers us empirical evidence that humans are capable of collective action. Enemies have reconciled. Radical surprises in technology are not only negative. Science has eradicated historical diseases and improved crop yields, as well as constructed horrendous weapons. Experience can reset mindsets. We see things not as they are, but as we are, said the writer Anais Nen. Think about the shifts, if not the complete shifts, in attitudes in a couple of generations to genocide, to slavery, to empire, and to race. New images can reset mindsets. Think of the impact of discovering that there wasn't an end of the world to drop off. Up to then, all the most intelligent people who'd ever lived thought the Earth was flat. Think of the blue planet image of the Earth floating there in space, photographed by Apollo 17 in 1972. Think of the resetting of the mindset that might come from a photograph of one of the last polar bears on a melting piece of ice. Crises can clarify. It's not my preferred theory of change, but sometimes the worse, the better. Two world wars led to a significant resetting of mindsets about international organizations and about human rights. COVID has helped many people to rethink what's important in their own personal lives. I'm not suggesting that things will always get better, far from it, but I am suggesting that the conditions for better possibilities always exist, and that there are resources for hope, collectively and individually. Individually, we have more capability, we have more agency than in the past. And collectively, the agency of global civil society is not as far-fetched as it once seemed. And this point has been especially the case on single issue, uh, on, on single issues. For example, 
climate chaos. Think of the influence of Greta on the environment generally. Think of the influence of the individuals who make up Greenpeace. On nuclear weapons abolition, think of the people in ICANN. On growing trees in Africa, think of Wangari Maathai. On race relations, think of Mandela. Progress towards what Jürgen Habermas has called global domestic politics, that is pretty much international relations, recognizable international relations, but with a high, heightened sense of global consciousness. Progress towards thinking in terms of a global domestic politics is hindered by the anarchical system of sovereign nation states. Arguably, the international level of world politics is, the, is still the level with the greatest causal weight, as Waltz used to put it. And if we don't get the international right, as Kant sort of hinted, we won't get much else right in the world. In important ways, we are all children of international relations. By that, I mean that even before we were born, our lives were shaped by the tides, the great tides of international history. Our lives were shaped by the wars, the trade routes, the diplomatic agreements, and all the other things that happened in international history. The revolution that's needed is to challenge our parent international relations and to reject the mental chains that uh, were clamped on us at birth about the ways in which the world works, particularly looking through the lens of the nation state. The way ahead for me consists of building solidarity as common humanity. And through thinking about common humanity, before our own tribe, we might improve the conditions of possibility for a global we of values, as well as, a, as, well as the global we of fate, which is where we are. Some will criticize this perspective as universalizing. But for me, it's not, this perspective is not inconsistent with seeing the richness of particular human beliefs and behaviors. Crucially, I think we've got to recognize shared realities such as human needs, basic human needs. We should recognize cultural universals and we should recognize the universal persistence of puzzles about relations across borders. And academically, this wider perspective is somewhat challenged by approaches that are characterized by reductionism, relativism, sectarianism, what I call micro fetishism and nationalism. And con connectivity, the search for connections is my pill against these ills. This involves seeking connections between real people in real places. I wrote a book on ethnocentrism in the 1970s. It involves seeking connections between real people in real places and universal ideas such as emancipation, which has been a theme in my thinking for about security for the last 30 years or so. Connectivity in a slogan means searching for the universal in the unique and the unique in the universal. And I want to offer you two illustrations of this connectivity in conclusion. First, in Toby Green's economic history of West Africa, 
a fistful, the book is called A Fistful of Shells, it's written oh, two or three years ago. He criticizes the all too familiar view of the past that Africa had virtually no history worth exploring before the arrival of the Europeans. He points to the rich history of Africa before the Europeans uh, in terms of the, its art, uh, its religion, and indeed the extravagant and odd behavior of royal families. So far, so familiar. More to the point, it was also a history of kingdoms, of empires, of warfare, of trade, of diplomacy. In other words, Africa before the Europeans arrived was very much like the traditional, conform very much to the traditional agenda of international relations in the rest of the world. You can see the unique in the universal. The, 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 the traditional IR agenda was there in Africa before colonization and in arguably colonization is just another part of the traditional agenda of international relations or there wouldn't have been empires. And don't forget that in what many people regard as the most realist of uh, IR texts, Hans J. Morgenthau's Politics Among Nations, imperialism, is one of the three standard uh, ways of approaching the international. Another way of describing what I'm getting that is provided by Chinu Achebe, the most prominent of Africa's angry young men uh, in the late 1950s, as was the phrase of the time. Achebe used to say how he hated, and justifiably, how he hated the depiction of his people in novels from Europe. And he was especially critical of what he called the colonialist style of Joseph Conrad. Achebe once said, there is that great proverb that until the lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. And Achebe's own stories could be taken as those of the historian of the brave lions. In his most famous book, Things Fall Apart, which was published in 1958, he described the white man's cunning, divide and rule tactics, propensity to use violence, and ultimately, success in the colonial venture. What I'm suggesting is welcoming the lion's perspective, because in different contexts, I want to say that we're all lions and we're all potentially hunters. What I'm suggesting is welcoming the lion's perspective as it gives us a richer picture of what was going on. But the lion's story doesn't change the hunt's universal features, the, the hunt's universal uh, characteristics. International relations, like the hunt, has characteristic, one of its dominating, its dominating characteristics is no authority. And in the hunt, there's no authority above the hunter or the hunted to sort it all out. There's no overwhelming power. The, in the hunt and in international relations, there's conflicting interests. The hunt is a story of a particular distribution of power. The hunt is a story of a willingness to engage in violence. The hunt is a story of strategies and tactics of cunning and courage. The hunt is a story of winners and losers. In other words, even a leocentric perspective, a lion's perspective on the hunt, still to me sounds very much like traditional international relations with their persistent puzzles. And the same goes with some of the reductionist 
and I'd say the same about some of the reductionist approaches to international relations like post-colonialism. We must, I think, search for the universal in the unique. So in summary, the global, what I've been saying is that the global we as a community of fate is confronted by its greatest ever set of global reckonings. We are distracted by a global pandemic, but it remains business as usual. We need a revolution in the mind, a people's, a people's globalization. There are resources of hope in history, but time is being stolen by business as usual priorities in international politics, for example. Time is being stolen from solidifying the potential global we as a community of values. Does this mean that things have to get worse, perhaps much worse, before they get better? Probably. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much, Professor Campbell. I think it, uh, it has been the most inspiring speech <coughs> on the COVID-19, actually, because the, uh, it has been a year and a half, and uh, most of the publications are now dealing with the uh, what will the influence of the COVID-19 in international relations or uh, about this subject. And I have taken some notes uh, and if you don't mind, I would like to use the, my privilege to ask first question. If you don't mind, then I will get to some other questions from uh, lots of people, but I will try my best. If you don't mind, I would like to use the first line to ask. Uh, you, are the, you are the sovereign power. Uh, that, actually, that is the, uh, the main context of my questions. So if uh, you picturize the, all the international relations and the, all the cliches actually about the, the difference between the developed countries, developed nation state countries, uh, and the, the responses to the uh, COVID-19 uh, health crisis. So all the cliches actually about the, their reactions and the, how they value their human beings or their citizens, not human beings. So when they are talking about the possible influence of the, or the worst effect of the COVID-19, they mostly think the universally. Uh, but uh, you mentioned that these cliches actually, they are not covered. Uh, they don't cover the, the rest of the world actually. So if they are the sovereign power in international relations and the dominating the rest, uh, so what, how this influence will be uh, dealt by the whole international relations. You know, the, the, today the UN uh, summit is now going on and uh, most of the leaders, they, are, they will say, uh, they will talk about the COVID-19 and they will have to deal it globally. So, but the, all the, these cliches actually referring that they are not dealing the crisis globally, but they are centered about the nation states and their nation citizens. So what would you say about that? Uh, so you mentioned that the reality is not uh, something Lenin's word, I think you mentioned. So uh, what is the reality of the COVID-19 in current world politics? Thank you very much. <clears throat> is it? Well, I... I... I could uh, give some figures to point out some of the um, some of the incredible things that jo uh, Gordon Brown, the um, former British Prime Minister, said on the radio earlier this week. He was talking about how in Britain things were promised, 
uh, about how how many he was giving figures. I can't quite remember what they were about how many vaccines would have to be destroyed in Britain um, because they had got out of date. And what uh, you, I'd like to be able to say that enough people in in Britain, as one example of the de developed world, um, that that is part of your question, um, that the global, that, sorry, that British public opinion would be so hostile that um, the government would uh, seek to act because it would realize that its interests are at stake in terms of getting re-elected. So that's one, one uh, channel uh, of approach that is to, to do one's best to try to show that although the government might talk about global health, it's not, it's not acting accordingly more money could be spent uh, and all the rest of it. But one has to somehow present it in ways that appeal to the government's, a government, any government self interest in maintaining power. Um, and I think Gordon Brown himself is a good example of somebody who is able to bring together both the moral uh, desirability, in my view, of uh, sharing, um, well, sharing is not a great word in this context, but in um, ensuring the uh, production, ensuring the production globally of enough, enough vaccines through changing positions on technology transfer, spending more money on the transport of vaccines uh, until particular regions are able to provide their own vaccines, perhaps sending money, whereas the British government, of course, was uh, cutting foreign aid this year, sending money to help the health infrastructures of different countries and, and all the rest. So the line to adopt, I think, is, is the one that Gordon Brown was advocating, many other people have advocated it and before him, that is, this is not, we shouldn't see it as an either or choice. It's not uh, either sharing or not sharing, but in fact, we are rich enough to do both. That is, we are rich enough uh, to use the vaccines that we have and need in the UK through production, and we have enough money and resources to help with the other G7 countries to provide regional manufacturers with the wherewithal to spread the vaccine. So I think this is potentially uh, a win-win situation and we shouldn't think about, about it as in terms of we the rich sharing with the poor, but let's how Let's see the connections and let's see how we can help them to um, look after, learn to look after themselves. I'm not sure if this answers your question, but... Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to spare, well, I, we could argue uh, together and I think there are other people who want to ask some questions. So uh, the other question is... Asked by the professor Andrew Lung, uh, he wrote his questions, but uh, if you don't mind, you can ask by yourself. Uh, but uh, could you please keep it short? Just ask the question, not like me. Uh, professor Andrew? Andrew Lung? Uh, I can well, just... Uh, I can, yeah. okay. uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, first of all, I'm uh, much enlightened um, by the esteemed professor's um, expose of the, the world we are in, uh, particularly highlighting the, uh, the impact of COVID-19, uh, or um, it's not in a game-changing way, but one of the things we've seen before. Uh, the suggestion seems to be that, that the world has, been, has seen a lot of ups and downs 
and we have seen it before, we've been there before. Um, but my question is that what are the some of the really game changing dynamics in this world? Because um, we are no longer in the world which was um, a relatively, relatively more stable world uh, immediately after the Second World War. We are now seeing major dynamics in international uh, geopolitics uh, confronting each other. Um, the world seems to be broken into uh, camps or uh, in confront confrontational way. Um, even the kind of common issues of climate change and pandemic and various other uh, common problems like terrorism seems to embed um, a kind of um, nationalism, if you, if you like, uh, or um, if you um, uh, speaking from this um, the seat of America, America exceptionalism, American leadership. Uh, the view seems to be that the American-led global order is now under threat, um, and then America needs to rally uh, the so-called okay. allies to you know and, and, and confront China. Somebody. So, keep your so what's, what's your take on this? Um, the world doesn't seem to be um, the same as we have experienced before. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, uh, um, your question started out by talking about game changers. Um, first, I would say that most of what you talked about are not really game changers. They're not changing the game. They're changing the players in the game. That is, America might not be what it was, but another will come or another, another state will take its place and become the unipolar, you might argue. Um, or uh, it won't be a case of a unipolar moment. It will be another case of a bipolar mo moment, presumably China and the United States. Changing geopolitics, changing the players in geopolitics, and changing the camps. Uh, that's not a get, they're not game changers. That's international politics business as usual. That's how it's been for the, for the last uh, thousand years. Game changing dynamics change, change the game, not just the players within the game. And in that respect, I would say that there are two that uh, potentially come to mind or that actually come, come, come to mind. Uh, this particular, well, three actually. Um, this particular pandemic is not one of them, but one could imagine a super pandemic um, that is beyond some disease that is beyond our capacity to uh, control it at all. Some science fiction nightmare. So that, that would be one game changer. Another game changer would be massive nuclear proliferation, which would increase the chances of nuclear weapons being used. And although people, experts over the years since the 19 certainly since the early 1960s, have expected um, proliferation to accelerate. It's actually uh, accelerated very, very slowly. But one could imagine something sparking in um, the Middle East in, in particular. Um, and if all of a sudden you had, we had eight nuclear weapons powers in the Middle East, one could think of really horrendous wars uh, taking place, um, which, would, which would change the game of international relations because if a big part of the world started using nuclear weapons, then I think there, there would have to be a resetting of uh, realities, uh, sorry, a resetting of mindsets, as was the case I pointed out uh, when we discovered the Earth was not was not flat, so nuclear weapons is another one. But the really big one, I think, is is of uh, climate chaos, true climate chaos, uh, and we don't know how. You know, we don't know how that's going to play out uh, on. You know, in in thirty or forty years' time, if indeed 
um, we don't come to control it in some way in the next 20 years because of the fear that it won't be sort of a gradual climate change, but it will, it will accelerate in all sorts of uh, probably unpredictable ways. So I think the real, and, and I do worry about losing fish in the seas, soil erosion, uh, the impact of climate on uh, the ability of some parts of the world to deliver to deliver the food that the global population needs and so on. So the real game changers are climate and the environment, nuclear weapons proliferation and some super pandemic. But the things you were talking about, I don't regard them as game changers. They're just different players in the old game. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, by rising hand first, I think it is time to give the floor to ask a question, Faik Hassan. Could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, if you don't mind, I would like to ask you really keep your uh, question short because we don't have enough time. Uh, thank you. Sir, it seems that value system which is uh, modern in nature and still evolving. I can't hear can you speak up a bit? Okay. Sir, it seems that the value system, which is modern and still evolving, is in collision with the historical ideologies and culture. Security, military might thinking are acting as uh, value addition, doing a work of art. Then. Should this confrontation need to be addressed? If so, how to address this confrontation? I hope I am audible. Yeah, you're, you're, you're quite faint, but I, I could get it. it. There was one word I was missing. It sounded like consultation? Confrontation, sir. Oh, on a confrontation. Yes, confrontation. On, a, on, a, on a mode of collision, sir. The modern value system and the historical ideologies and culture. <clears throat> My response to that and i can think of the the counter uh, immediately that is we don't have time to do the world doesn't have time to do the things that we need to do um in this respect but attitudes i think can sometimes change quickly and the confrontation to me has to essentially been be fought out in the, as Philip Pallet says, in the mind, not in the streets. And this means for those of us who are educated, but ed educators, but in fact, for every one of us, uh, we should consider our responsibility uh, as uh, our, becoming our own foreign and defense policy uh, advocates. And in every conversation with our nearest and dearest, with our children, with our parents, with people that we meet and engage them in a conversation, if, especially if they start hawking, to use my favorite word of the morning, if they start hawking ideas about race, about um, about economics, about equality, uh, about people who are different and so on and so forth. We have to confront them and change, try and change the way society as a whole thinks about these things. And if we can do that, then we may be able to change how our governments uh, think about these things um, and and things can be changed we do have resources for hope you know I, it, from the perspective of the 1930s um, it would be remarkable that the British government uh, would make a commitment or other governments of developing countries would give commitments to provide um, foreign 
aid and that individual citizens would give collectively enormous amounts of money in this respect. So, and some of the confrontations can be very low level, if you like, but can completely change people's minds. Let me give you just one example that, that comes to mind. And I, and I think here, the responsibility that we have as educators, one of the responsibilities is to try to use language more carefully than uh, most other people. We have the time to think about these things more than other people. But there's a sort of casualness that some people use when they're talking about uh, this confrontation. And I'll, the one example I'll give you is, is about race. And it's an issue that is very um, close, to, close to me because my wife and I have mixed heritage grandchildren. Um, and uh they they get talked about or mixed heritage grant uh, young youngsters and people get talked about as being mixed race even by people who claim to be anti-racist use this phrase mixed race well there are two problems at least with that characterization of mixed race one is the idea that it reifies the danger, that it reifies race. It implies that there is something about race as opposed to being a malign, uh, a malign idea that humans developed at some point. So it sort of reifies race, but also the very phrase, if you put mixed in front of it, mixed race means that somewhere there must be pure race. You can't have mixed race without there being pure race. And this is, <laughs> and the idea of um, anti-racists is uh, rightly to get rid of the idea of race, but just to use that phrase, um, reifies it, makes it appear that race is a real thing. So what I'm saying is from this very small example, is that these confrontations between the old and the new happen all the time and we can intervene in friendly ways you know oh have you thought of this or whatever we can in fact fight begin to fight those battles um at the individual level so um so it's a it's a multi it's a multi-level um, task to um, to con to to try to win the confrontation between the old. I do think that in many respects the old is dying, uh, but 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 it's it's still very strong. Patriarchy, for example, is an obvious case where uh, it's still very strong. But I think it's dying. The Economist last week, I think, or the week before, had an editorial with a title like um, "Societies That Fail Women Fail," some title like like that. Uh, that would not have been a typical uh, Economist uh, editorial title maybe 10 years ago, certainly not 50 years ago. So I think we have to fight the battle, the confrontation, and try to win it in whatever situation we are in. We've each got different responsibilities. And uh, those of us who have most education and most access to audiences have the most responsibility. Thank you. Thank you again. I think the next question is coming from the Dr. Uh, Ayla Göl. Uh, if you don't mind, could you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Hi, I think my video is a bit funny. I'll, I'll, 
I'll, I'll just speak. Uh, thanks, Karen. It's just always uh, uh, inspiring and a privilege to hear your food for thought ideas. But it just made me a bit skeptical about your suggestion, your pill of connectivity. I want to go back to your second cliche that you said health is not really global is conceived nationally so if we are offer if you are offering connectivity as a global we of fate and then it made me to think about real people and real places the the stark example is just what happened in afghanistan i mean people were just you know falling from sky and uh, i think international i don't want to use global community as as you were uh, referring but maybe international community really failed them miserably so like the street seller in lisbon you were skeptical i am a bit skeptical of your appeal as well i mean it seems to me that global consciousness that global we of fate is a bit utopian and i am wondering how you in the in the sense of this enhanced nationalism I think I agree with you. It's just going to get worse before it starts getting better. Thank you. Thanks, Ayla. I think um, I think I probably didn't make some things clearer, clear enough. The the global we of fate uh, is. I use that term just to suggest that humans globally have been thrown together in this era um, by fate in relation to technology, for example. We live in a smaller world. Uh, we all, there are more of us. We depend upon the environment to provide food and so on. So this is just, so I'm using the term uh, global way of fate to describe how it is at the level of, um, at, the at the level of material realities. The global we of values is the one that uh, is evident across the world, but not well enough developed from my point of view, and I know from your point of view. And this global we of values includes all those people who found that the way the British and the Americans behaved in Afghanistan was appalling. Um, so I don't see I don't see what you said as being uh, contrary to what I'm saying, uh, what I'm being arguing. I would just be arguing for um, more governments to live up to what they say, uh, what they will be saying in the United Nations uh, today, for example. Uh, live up to their live up to their words um, at the G7 meeting in the UK in June, I think it was. The G7 talked about um, um, rolling out vaccines for the world and getting rid of the pandemic, but actions have not followed through. There are plenty of illustrations of where the national dimension comes through above the um, pill of recognizing connectivity and trying to build connectivity. I completely accept that and that's why I think that things might have to get worse before they get better. I don't think there's a disagreement between us. There's just a slight misunderstanding as a result of me perhaps not making it clear enough what I meant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kemfrut. I think we are already overreached our 
uh, time. Uh, so uh, we have just five minutes for the next panel. Uh, I would like to thank you again. And uh, before ending the uh, this session, uh, I have used my soaring power <laughs> position uh, to say something about the most impressed concept of your speech. Uh, I think uh, the, all the cliches you mentioned, uh, one way or another, another uh, relating to resetting of mindset. So uh, that was the most uh, uh, inspiring uh, proposition, actually, for me. But uh, I think the rest of the participants would agree with me. So uh, there is an ongoing nationalist uh, perspective of uh, global issues. Yeah, that's right. The, the, what the professor can put actually emphasize that one. Uh, and I think the best solution is the, as Professor Kenfoot can put uh, emphasized, resetting of mindset. Uh, and by these words, I would like to end this session. And it will be my honor for the rest of my life that I moderate your uh, keynote uh, speech for the conference. Uh, I personally thank you, and in the name of CESRA International and Observare, I would like to thank you all for your participation to this uh, first uh, keynote speech of IAPAS 2021. Uh, that will be end of the, our uh, first session. Uh, after four minutes, we are going to start the next panel, so uh, you can uh, keep stay online uh, for the next panel. Uh, the recording for this session will be ended uh, a minute later. And right after that, the recording for the next panel is going to start. And thank you very much uh, again. Uh, see you within the two days again. Thank you. Thank you very much.